Good morning, New Day Church family. How are we doing today? So good to see you guys. So good to worship with you today. And uh, I am excited. We're continuing our Christmas series among us. And the main objective in this time together is uh, we are focusing our hearts and minds on the real Christmas story. And the hope of this for your life and for my life is that as we do this, that this will be a season of um, not just hype and fun stuff, though that's good, but of genuine hope in your life. Like, I, I don't just want you to be busy during Christmas. My hope and my heart for you is that God would do a good work in your life through this season. And even as Dr. Vic come, came up and just shared his testimony, um, man, it just, just reminds me that, like, people change. People change. And sometimes we forget that. We get cynical in life, and we just kind of believe that everything just kind of is what it is, and, and we don't really give ourselves um, to what God could do in our life. And so today as we dive into our, our passage, um, I want to preach to you a message today titled, Be Light or Be Liked. Be Light or Be Liked. And I am really passionate about this today because I think not only is it a timeless message that I'm going to give us today, but it's a very timely message for the moment that, that you live in. Because here, here's, here's the question. Will we experience the light of Jesus and will we offer that to the world? That's the question. Like, is our life going to make a difference? Is our life going to contribute to the negativity and to the hopelessness of our generation or are we going to actually be light in this world? Will we have the courage to be light? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference these statistics later in the sermon, but I just feel prompted to, um, to share these now. There's actually a picture um, of the actual article that I got this from. This just came out, and I'll be honest. I don't, it's hard for me to even believe this is true. And so I'll be honest, there is part of me that's like, I'm reading these statistics, and I'm like, man, can it really be that bad. But I, this is the latest CDC report from 2021. Uh, you can go find the article. The Washington Post just did a big story on it. It's kind of circulating around the internet right now. And, and what it is, is the CDC is giving you the statistics to let you know why they have declared that, that currently everybody, but specifically young people, are in a mental health crisis. Mental health crisis. The latest data says this. This was their research, the CDC, in 2021. They said 45% of high school students, 45% of high school students were so persistently sad or hopeless in the year 2021 that they were at some point unable to engage in regular activities. The CDC reported that almost one in five seriously considered suicide. One in five, 20% of young people, of the youngest generation, seriously considered suicide. And I don't know how this is true. They said 9% of teens that they surveyed tried to take their lives in the previous 12 months. And we've also referenced here before that the most recent data is that um, for the emerging generations, for the first time ever, they are more likely to take their life by suicide than to lose their life by homicide. The first time that's ever been true. And maybe some of us are kind of, you know, isolated from this, or maybe we don't have kids in that age, that stage of life, or, or, or maybe we just kind of have a healthy community around us. And listen, I'm, I, I'm, I'm blessed by that, you know, like I don't, when I see those statistics, that doesn't really correlate with what I experience in the church, but, but it's when they survey the world, what they're seeing out there. And the youngest generations are always important because they are the future and they're showing you what's coming. And so when I read those statistics, my question to you today for your life, will you be light or will you be liked in the world? I want to explain what that means today. But if you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 1. Leave your hard copy or if you have it on your phone, I do encourage you to open up the Bible. It's good to be in the rhythm of doing that, of learning how to open it up. John is... Um, the fourth book in the New Testament, you know, kind of towards the end of the Bible, if you're looking at the Bible as a whole. And we're going to read uh, John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. And we've been going through uh, John's account of the Christmas story because it's a little bit unique. 
Um, it's more creative, it's more artistic, it's more imaginative, and it's just really beautiful. And as I, I read this over us today, I, I just really want you to feel the beautiful weight of these words, that Christmas really is supposed to be a season of transformation. So I'm going to read John 1, verses 9 through 13, uh, but this time if you would stand with me in the honor of reading God's word. John 1, starting in verse 9. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen behind me. It says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May God bless the reading of his word. You can be seated. So I want to start in verse 9 today. In verse 9, John says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And here is the really good news today. And this is maybe the most important thing I'm going to tell you all day. Number one. There is light in the darkness. You're like, but John, but John, but what about this? No, no, no. There, there is light in the darkness. Amen? We are Christians. We are Christ followers. We are people of hope, right? We, we are people who are optimistic about the future. We are people that we go through hardship, but we always have hope. So what Christmas reminds us first and foremost is that there is true light which came into the world, which means there is hope. Yes, there is darkness, there is brokenness, there is sin, there are issues. But let me be clear today, there is hope. Let me just say that, there's hope. I just want to release those words into the atmosphere. There's hope in your life. There's hope. No matter what you're facing right now, God is good and God has a good plan. No matter what you've done in your life, there is hope for you and there is hope for your family. I was thinking uh, this past week of the best Christmas gift that I ever got. And uh, if I had to guess like the best gift that I ever got, the one that would just like blew me away, it was when I was like 14 or 15 years old. Uh, When I was like early in high school, I learned to play like the guitar with this like little cheap acoustic just kind of hanging around the house. And so I kind of picked it up and started learning to play it. I was really into bands like Nirvana and all that kind of stuff. And so I started learning how to play like different songs on the acoustic. And then I wanted to like level up. And so I wanted an electric guitar because it was just so much cooler, uh, like Dylan up here. And I I wanted um, an electric guitar. And so I asked my, my mom or Santa, I forgot how it worked, which one exactly gave me that one. But uh, my mom always had a thing where she, I told her at one point I was having some doubts about Santa, and she said, well, if Santa ain't real, Santa don't get you nothing. So I was like, I believe. <laughs> I believe, you know, a believer, you know. Um, but uh, I think it was my mom, but I asked for a, an electric guitar. And then um, a few days before Christmas, there were some gifts that were just out under the tree in advance, just tempting me. Um, and so I saw this one gift, and it, it looked like a, a box that an electric guitar would come into. And so, true story, one day after school, uh, went home, nobody was around. It's like, hello. It's real quiet, you know. So I was like, oh, I, I guess nobody's home. And I gave in to the temptation. I just had to know, is this an electric guitar? And I opened it up, and it was an electric guitar. And I'm not even kidding. I, I unwrapped that present. I took it out the box. I strapped it on, looked at myself in the mirror, and jammed on it. I mean, it was just like, it was, it was a moment in my life I will never forget. Maybe you can remember like an amazing gift that you got. You, you held that precious thing in your hands, and you were just so happy. That was me with this gift. But then, of course, I didn't want to, like, you know, get grounded from the guitar before I even got the guitar. So I um, dishonestly uh, put the guitar back in the box. I wrapped it back up, totally legit, put it back under the tree, and my mom never knew, right? It's true story. She never knew. And then on the day of when I got it, I acted really surprised because I was surprised. But what was interesting was, if I'm honest, it, it, waiting for the guitar that I, I knew that I already had, it honestly wasn't that hard. Because I had hope. 
I, I, I had hoped that I was getting something special. No, no matter what I knew, it might take a few days, I might not see it right now, but in a few days that guitar is coming. And what I want you to know is that biblically that's how the Bible defines hope. Hope is not like a wish-washy, I kind of hope this works out. The, the world uses the word hope very differently than we're supposed to use the word hope. When the Bible says hope, it means, and I quote, a confident expectation of good in the future. And so when Jesus is in our lives, what that means is that he always has us and he's always good to us. And so whenever we sin, even as a Christian, he's always going to forgive us. And when we give our life to Jesus, even when we go down a wrong path, he is always faithful to bring us back and to bring us to heaven with him in the end. We always have hope. And so what Christmas shows us is that even in the darkness, the true light, which gives life to everyone, was coming into the world. And it says true light, that word true is important because what it means is that there will be things in this world which kind of seem like light, but they're not really light. And we have to guard our hearts from the things that, that we know don't really give us true life. And, and the way, one of the easiest ways that I know how to like understand this is like, just think about the things in your life that you're looking to. And if there's, a, if there's an expiration date on the joy that it gives you, that means it's not true life. And so there are good things in the world that we're called to do for seasons that are really good. God created us to work. God created us to do things. But our whole life is not about just being a kid or just being a parent or a certain job that we have or a season of life or a season where I have the physical ability to do something. You know, like it's not about these temporary things that we kind of give all of ourselves to. We, we don't build our life around temporary things because that's not smart. Jesus is the true light who can give life and light to anyone in any situation, forgive you of any sin, fulfill you in any season of life. And what I love about Jesus and the church, and I always love to tell people this, the church is literally for all of life. It's from the, the womb to the tomb. How incredible is that? That we dedicate children in the church and then we have funerals in the church and we walk through all the seasons of life together in the church. Like, no matter who you are, what stage of life you're at, there, there is hope and there is something for you. And that is because Jesus is the true light. So we want to make this season about that. That when the light comes into your life, all of a sudden we trust Jesus with everything. You see, hope reinterprets everything in your life. You might have pain, but your pain always has a purpose. You might be facing some destruction in your life or something falling apart, but there is always instruction in your destruction. God always has something he's showing you. Or you might say, man, I have messed up my life. And the, 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 the reality is, no, no, you have set up God to do something incredible in your life. And as we come to this Christmas season, may I exhort you and encourage you to make this season not about hiding, but about healing. Because that's what a lot of people do in Christmas, but other seasons of life is it's like instead of actually fixing the things in our life and bringing them to Jesus and experiencing life change, we just kind of ignore it, put a smile on, and act like nothing's happening. And can I tell you as a pastor, I watch people all the time, that you, you can only hide it for so long. You, you can only act like something's not wrong for, for so long in your life. And especially during Christmas, because once again, it's supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year. And you see the movies and everybody else on social media, and you're like, man, my family stinks, you know? Like, my, my kids are crazy, you know? My marriage is not good, whatever it is, you know? Like, I, we're broke compared to, with, how'd they afford that, you know? Like, like all the things, and, and, and we just want to put the smile on and just kind of fake it, but how wonderful is it that Christmas can be a season if we put all the hype aside and we say, you know what, Jesus, I, I just want to know you and walk with you and and what if the greatest thing that you got this Christmas season was just hope in your life? You can have that. And as I love to point out, hope is free, by the way, right? Jesus is free. All the stuff on Amazon is not free, but Jesus is free. And so the light is coming into the world. There is hope in our life. But I want you to hear verses 11 and 12 because this is critical, and especially in our day. Verse 11 he being Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him, meaning many of, of, the, of the Jewish people in his culture did not receive him or believe him. Verse 12, but all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
And so really simply stated, what I want to tell you is this, just to be really clear. We either receive or reject Jesus and the new identity that he gives us. That, that's what this is saying. That Jesus came into the world and some people received him and some people rejected him and it's the same today. Jesus is hope. Jesus is light. Jesus can be your savior. He, he will forgive you of your sins. He will do this all for free. It is a gift, but like anything else, we, we must receive that gift. And I want to be clear because I think for some people today, Jesus is just like an intriguing figure to think about. It's kind of inspiring, kind of got some good teaching. I recently heard an interview with Elon Musk, and, and the, the, some Christians were actually asking him about what he thinks about Jesus, and he's like, he's good, you know, he's good, you know, he's done some good things, you know, and he just kind of like says a few things and kind of moves on, right? It's like, but, but no, he's not just an intriguing figure to, to think about. He is either the savior of the world or he's not. He's either your salvation or he's not. And there's a clear line in the sand, do you believe or not? And your friends and your family, they either receive Jesus or they reject Jesus. And indecision is a decision, by the way. Indecision is a decision. I feel like it's something like a dad says. Indecision is a decision, decision, son. Like that, like that's, it is a decision. And that's actually what helped me when I got serious about my faith in high school. Probably like most people, I was impacted by like postmodernism. It's like your truth, my truth, everybody's right, everybody's whatever. And eventually I just like had to like rationally come to a place where I realized like, you know, we can be intrigued by a lot of things, but everyone's ultimately giving their life to something. Everybody is ultimately building their life on one ultimate conviction. And when I realized that, I had to say, listen, I have to make a decision on Jesus. And by God's grace, I chose Jesus. But we have to choose what we build our life on. The light is coming into the world, but we either receive it or we reject it. Receiving Jesus is like everything else in your life. It's like, which house do I buy? Do I buy this house or this house? And we got to make a decision because we definitely can't afford both. Amen, right? Like, I, I can barely afford one, right? I can't have like five houses. Which person do I marry? You got to be clear on that decision. It's like, I'm kind of into like four people. It's like, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works, right? Like, you pick a person, which job do I take, right? Like, don't tell your boss, yeah, I got like four jobs. You're not going to get that job, right? Like, which job am I going to take? All of our de decisions define our life and define where we end up. And the same is with Jesus, our Savior. And maybe you're here today or maybe you know someone, they say something like this. This is a common thing. They say like, well, you know, like I... Um, I don't know, like, is Jesus the only way to heaven? Like, when it says he's the way, the truth, the life, like, you know, like, I don't know, why, why can't I get salvation from, like, this person or this person or this person or this religion, like, all these different ideas or whatever. Um, and first of all, like, to me that, when you think about that, that's a little, um, a little weird. Because, like, imagine, like, somebody, like, walks up to your house and, like, knocks on your door. And, and you open up the door and, like, hey, I heard that, you know, you've got, like, a a big mortgage or an expensive car or a lot of debt or you just need some money. I, I want to give you like a million bucks right now, just right now. And imagine if, if, if somebody were to do that, but the way that the person receiving it responds is like, well, why do I got to receive it from you? Why can't I get it from Ted? Why has it got to be you? You know, it's like, first, just take the money, okay? Like, just take it, right? So salvation, just, just take it, Right? But, but number two, the guy would say, because nobody else is offering you a million dollars. I'm here to offer you that. And what is unique about Christianity in light of other world religions is other world religions, when you study them, they're not the same. They don't offer the same thing. Muhammad, Buddha, other people, they did not die for you. They did not even claim to die for you in your sins. And so it's important that we... we we learn and we hear what's being taught because what Jesus is offering us in the gospel, him dying on the cross for our sins and rising again because all of us are broken and all of us are sinful, Jesus is giving us something that nobody else is giving us. Everybody else is distracting us in life and Jesus is dying for our sins, rising again and giving us new life in him. And we receive that 
or we don't, okay? Listen, people dying for your sins is not a super crowded market, okay? There's not a lot of that going on. Like, look at the world around us. But how incredible is it to realize that the one that is dying for us is God himself? What a message to behold and what a message to offer to our friends and our family and to our children, and so we have this light, but we have to receive or reject the light. But then I, I really want to lean into here, verses uh, 19 through 28. We didn't read it earlier, but I just think this is a really dynamic passage for the moment that we're in. It kind of highlights a guy named John the Baptist. Um, and so I'm going to read this, and then I'll kind of explain it here in a second. But Jesus has come into the world, and so this kind of fast forwards a little bit. And it says, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? So what happens is, is Jesus is, is born into the world. Um, and then at the age of 30, he begins his public ministry. But before he does that, God essentially sends a guy named John the Baptist, who was a relative of Jesus, uh, kind of ahead to invite people to repent, to prepare way for, for Jesus coming. It's almost like announcing the coming ministry of Jesus. And so this guy named John the Baptist, he's like, he's like a rough, like, dude's dude, okay? This is not like a, you know, like a, like a soft person. This is like a guy that's like rough. He eats like locusts and wild honey. He's just a really raw kind of dude, right? Think of like, I'm like liver king or something in the world today. Like, that's what this guy, but he's not taking steroids, right? Um, and so, like, uh, this guy's a guy's guy. And so he, but, but here's what's happening. He's kind of proclaiming that Christ is coming, the kingdom's at hand. But people are beginning to take notice, and they're kind of starting to come against him. And so they say, who are you? Verse 20, John the Baptist confessed and did not deny, but confessed. He noticed that, did not to die, but he confessed. I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to them, well, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And I love this. He said, verse 23, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Verse 24. Now these people have been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, then why are you baptizing if you are neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. So here's where it gets really real. So the light comes into the world and we receive or reject that light, right? We can have hope in our life, but we have to invite Jesus into our life. We have to make that decision. But at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist goes and he's preparing the way, but get this, what happens? People begin to come against John. He describes himself as a, a voice crying out into the wilderness he starts getting pushed back and people are questioning him, but he stands firm and is faithful and keeps pointing people to Jesus. Now you might ask, what ends up happening to John? Here's what happens to John. John gets beheaded. And legend has it that his head gets served up on a platter. He gets beheaded. The reason why he gets beheaded is because there was a, a Roman appointed king of Judah back in his time who had divorced his wife so that he could marry his niece Okay, kind of weird. And John the Baptist called him out on it. So that's not right. Like, you shouldn't do that. That's wrong. That, that's corrupt. I don't care what anyone tells you because nobody wanted to speak truth to the king. He's like, I don't care who you are. That's wrong. And eventually, uh, the niece that, he, that the king marries, she has a, a grudge against John. So eventually, she basically calls for his head. He gets beheaded, and he loses his life. But he was faithful to the end. And I say that because probably for most of us, that's probably not going to be your story. But I say that because I think that in, in the world that we live in, and I think this is true for everybody, not just Christians, but I, I know it's true for Christians, that if, if we are going to really offer the hope and the light of Jesus in this world, we, we have to learn to be comfortable with people not liking us. We got to get used to that. 
And I think what's happening is we're kind of like a, if I'm honest, like a soft generation. Like we, like this dude's getting beheaded faithfully, you know, and like someone says something bad about me on social media or somebody got mad at me because I believe what the Bible says about something. And I just want to like crawl up in a hole and cry. And, and I'm there with you. I think we're all kind of used to just everybody affirming us and all these kinds of things. But I, we, are, we are heading into a world with so much potential if we can be honest about the light. And I'm, I'm your pastor, and so I, I will always just tell you the, the truth. Like at the end of the day, if, if we're going to make a difference in this world, we're probably in some ways not going to be liked. And it's not that we're arrogant. It's not that we're mean. It's not that we're judgmental. It's just that, listen, if you stand up for what the Bible says in these times, listen, if you say truth that could actually help people, people will not like that message. And that's Okay. Now, what I said earlier is it's, it's also true because, like, everyone is disliked today, no matter what you believe. You know, whatever political, whatever you believe, right, there's someone that doesn't like you. So here's my challenge. Be disliked for the right things. Be disliked for something that could actually change somebody's life. And we get to choose in life. We can be light or we can be liked. And that's a decision that, that we all have to make, but... But here's why it's important, because as I read earlier, the CDC recent teenage mental health report, 45% of high school students were so persistently sad or hopeless in 2021, they were unable to engage in regular activities. That's the world that we live in. And how crazy is it in a, in a time when that is happening that, that we have the true light This is why Christmas can't be about consumerism. It can't be about just hot cocoa because we can change lives in the gospel of Jesus. Jesus has changed my life. Jesus has given me hope in my life. As we were singing earlier, I just kept thinking like, man, like who I would be without Jesus. And and what I would think about this, this moment in time without Jesus Have you taken time to think about, because we forget it, because we get so used to this hope, but there are people that literally do not have that hope. And so often the problem is, is like we maybe tried to be a light or tried to share hope with somebody once and got shut down, right? But it's like, and so, but, but when we think about it, we haven't really engaged that many people. Because it's true, some people will reject it, but a lot of people will accept it. I believed, and maybe you believed, and, and so listen, you're a human, and I'm a human. I turned, for, I used to, I would be a different person. I had other things, but I gave those up to follow Jesus, and it's more than worth it, and other people can make that decision as well, and at the very least, what we can do, and this is, I think, so important I love it says that we are the light of the world and that we shouldn't cover up our light, but that we should let our light shine. That, that not only do we, do we share the hope with people of Jesus, but we, we just kind of like let our joy shine. We got to do that more often. Be more public about our faith. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's like, especially like in the workplace, like it's like, it's like acceptable to be like negative. But when someone is joyful, it's like that's fake. Like how sad is that, you know? It's like we can gossip, you know, but like no one's at the water cooler like, man, I had an incredible week, you know, like, man, I went to church, it's so good. He's like, we won't talk about that here. It's like, why, you know? I'm like, if we could talk about politics, we could talk about sports, we could talk about Jesus too. But it's funny, when that conversation comes up, it's almost like, and it gets too real, because it is real, you know? It's a real conversation that makes a real difference in people's lives. And so often we, we mistake the progress as a problem, but it's like people are taking notice. And many of you, you know this because it's like all of a sudden, like, well, why do you go to church all the time? Like, why can't you come to this thing on Sunday morning? Well, because I go to, to church. How, how come you don't do this thing you used to do? How come you don't come to these places anymore? How, how come you, you talk different now? How come you won't engage with me in that gossip anymore? Like, what's going on? Just like John the Baptist, you'll start getting questions. And my encouragement to you is is to be the light because that's what the world needs. 
So often we, we bemoan the world. We say we look at the world and we say it's chaotic or it's crazy, but then we refuse to be different from it. If, if we know that there, there's chaos in the world, then we have to be different. And the, the good news is, is that we can. And I know so many of you, it's why I want to share stories and testimonies because you have a light and we want that light to shine. One incredible example of this is like we went to uh, Florida a couple weeks ago and we went to this like really cool place called Marine Land. If, you've, if, you've, um, if you ever go to Florida or Jacksonville area, you got to go to Marine Land. Um, I don't know if this is true, but they say it's the first place to learn that you could actually train a dolphin, which is pretty epic. And so we went there and part of it was like I knew my wife would, would like that. And so we went there and we had like a little, you just kind of see the dolphins or whatever. And we get there and we realize this place you can actually pay a lot of money, but it's worth it, to go swim with the dolphins. And, and I, am, I, I am not exaggerating when I say I walked into that place like thinking that like my favorite animal over the years has been like, I like tigers and I like uh, panda bears. I, just always want, I don't know, I like those animals. And yet, true story, I, 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 I didn't swim with the dolphins because I couldn't afford it, but Halsey swam with the dolphins because we could afford that. We got to watch my wife swim with the dolphins, and I'm telling you, it was life-changing, not just for her, for us. Let me show a couple of pictures. I'll share, share these online. Look at that. <laughs> oh. <sighs> you feel your heart changing right now? That's my favorite one. Like, I walked out of there like legitimately, like my favorite animal for the rest of my life <laughs> is a dolphin. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I, I walked out of the, like, I, like, I'm like in this moment watching this and I'm like, I am being changed. <laughs> True story, my favorite animal now is dolphins. And it's like, my wife's joy and devotion and presence, it, it converted me to loving this thing that I didn't love that much before. And how incredible is it that, that we can live that on fire for something that could literally change people's lives? And when you realize the darkness and, and when you realize the hope and the difference and the light, it, it puts into perspective that, no, 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 I, I can't just live my life to fit in with everybody. I, I can't just live my life. Um, the, the sole purpose of my life cannot just be to get along and to never ruffle any feathers. I want to be respectful, but here's the reality is that we have to, to change to find this hope. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to share a story really quick, and then I want to kind of close with a, with a video. Uh, if you ever never heard the story of, of Jim Elliott, it is a truly remarkable story. Um, I do encourage you to look it up sometime. Jim Elliott um, was an American, and um, he felt a call to missions when he was in college, and he got married to his wife, Elizabeth Elliott, and... Um, Jim Elliott and four of his friends that were all believers um, felt a passion and a call to go to, um, to do global missions, and they chose a very dangerous tribe in Ecuador. And they knew that this tribe was, was dangerous, and they knew that it was risking their lives to take the gospel to them, but this group had literally never heard the gospel before, ever. This group was also... Um, Honestly, a, a, a tribe that even their own country didn't like, the, the country itself was actually trying to wipe this tribe out because they were just very violent, um, you know, very cruel people. And so, um, but Jim and his friends actually went to this tribe. They, they prepared a bunch to go in. And then true story, uh, whenever they went in to try and share the hope of Jesus with them, they thought they had it in at one point, but the tribe actually turned on them and killed all five of them. They were all in their 20s killed all five of them. And when the news got out, it was a, a big tragic story. And yet what, what has made this such an inspiring story for so many people and what has changed so many lives is that uh, Jim Elliott's wife, um, who kind of had a sense that maybe something was going to happen to her husband, um, after 
uh, all of them were martyred. Her with her daughter, they returned to that tribe that had taken the life of her husband and these people. Um, and over the years, they, they won many of them to Christ. And Elizabeth Elliot is now seen as one of these figures that has inspired global missions all around the world. And, and I encourage you sometimes to look it up, Jim Elliot or Elizabeth Elliot. But even when you read their writings, like I find conviction in my own life of like, man, these, these people have a level of devotion that I so often struggle to get to. And how incredible it would be if we had a, a community of people that were literally sold out for the hope of Jesus. Would that not shine so bright in these times? 